the audio first before we get into the meat of the discussion today. Still testing out the audio. I will begin as soon as I can hear myself. Okay. Just do a couple of mic checks here. Testing the audio. Testing the camera. Testing the audio again, testing the audio. We will begin shortly. Okay, sounds okay on my end. If you can hear me, if we are having no audio visual issues, please let me know. And we're going to get started with a topic. After we discuss that topic, we're going to get started with a topic. If you would like to ask questions later, that's cool. You can hear me, you can see me. Fantastic. It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to this episode of Q&A with the Coach live. This time, I'm going to start with a question from Derek Weber. He sent me an email. He said, hello, sir. I've been a fan of yours for years. Awesome. I greatly appreciate your honesty and thought process in your YouTube videos. I'm in my 40s. Me too. I'm 45 years old. I've practiced Tang Soo Do since I was eight years old. I've also dabbled in other arts to get a taste, but I've never left my roots for long enough for serious cross-training. I have many questions. For now, the one for today focuses on longevity for the practitioner in different martial arts. I would like to still be on the mat in my 70s, on towards my deathbed. In any case, I would appreciate your take on the martial arts that are best and worst suited for the goal of life long practice. Ideally focusing on a methodology that holds to the practice of learning from resistant, resisting opponents. Please include the most popular styles, Muay Thai, BJJ, etc. And any contrasting styles that you enjoy in your analysis, thank you for your time and consideration. So if you've been following my YouTube channel, you might notice I've put out some polls in the last few days about the topic of longevity. And as always, when I put out a poll, a lot of people like to write in the comment section, well, it depends on what you mean by longevity. That's a well-defined word. Oh, wow. Our friend Robert Sothman is in the comments. And shout out to Rob. If you didn't see the podcast that Rob and I did, it's up on the channel. Go give it a listen. It's a smart man. And I'm certain he has a lot of great things to say about this particular topic. But let's talk about those polls that I took. Check in my community tab. That's where they are. So the last one I asked was, which is best for longevity, strength training or cardio? And most people picked cardio. 54%, 46% chose strength training. And uh, what does the science say? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But it is interesting to see that in all of these polls, most of the folks tend, tended to pick the, the stuff that seemed easier, lighter, more gentle as that which would lead to longevity. What does longevity mean? It means long life. Long life. It is a very simply defined word, two words, long life. So it doesn't depend. That's what the word actually means. Another question, which is more important for martial arts training? Stretching before you train, stretching after you train, stretching while you train. Stretching is not important. And 55%, the overwhelming majority, chose, chose stretching before you train. And I suppose that makes sense since that's what a lot of people traditionally do. They'll do some stretching 
before class. And some people in the comments said, well, it depends, as they always do. It depends on what type of stretching we're talking about. And this is true. There are multiple types of stretching, static stretching, dynamic stretching, myo myofascial self-release stretching, reciprocal stretching, all different things, and there are different times to do those. Dynamic stretching prior to training, good. Static stretching prior to training, much less good. So that one, yeah, it certainly does depend on what we're talking about here. Another poll said, which exercise is best for longevity? Running, jogging, sprinting, walking. And a lot of people said, what is the difference between running, jogging, and sprinting? I thought they were, the, they were the same thing. Or in my language, in my country, we don't have separate words for those things. Most of you picked walking. As I mentioned before, most people picked the thing that seemed easier, lighter, softer, less dangerous, less jarring as the answer for what is best for longevity. Now, is that true? Is going easier on yourself better for longevity? Not always. So l let's address the question I got in this poll. Which exercise is best for longevity? Running, jogging, sprinting, walking. What's the difference between running, jogging, sprinting, the technique? Now, if we are following a colloquial definition, not an actual physical culture definition, of the difference between running, jogging, and sprinting, the answer would be speed, jogging being the slowest, but that speed changes the technique. A lot of people erroneously felt that jogging was the lowest impact exercise of that bunch, and that's false. It's actually the highest impact exercise of that selection because the speed at which you go causes the most impact on the joints. Jogging is a heel, ball, toe type of movement. Sprinting, when done correctly, toe, ball, heel. It is ergonomically correct. Jogging is the most ergonomically incorrect of those exercises. Most people picked walking. It's good to walk. You should walk every day. You should walk for a meaningful amount of time every day. And then the big one, the first question I asked, What's the best martial art for longevity? And I specifically put in four combat sports, and a lot of people didn't like that. They said, well, well, this other martial art you did not mention should be on the list. I did this specifically because our friend who sent me the letter, which we are answering today, Derek, he said, I want you to discuss the popular martial arts, Muay Thai, BJJ, etc. You know, the popular combat sports, Muay Thai, BJJ, boxing, wrestling. What's the best for longevity? Most people, 53%, chose Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And then the overwhelming majority of the comments were from angry people who didn't like that answer. How dare you choose Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? I got injured doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Or I heard that other people get injured doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, most people had a discussion about injury rates in combat sports. Now, if you do combat sports, you will get injured. Now, might, you will. You will. What that injury is, eh, we can't really say. A lot of people said, everybody who does Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu will mess up their knees. Everyone who does Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu jiu requires knee surgery. I've had some serious knee injuries, but not from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I had the most serious knee injury I had was one, getting kicked in the leg, and two, having a goofball who was climbing on the ceiling, unaware, unbeknownst to me, fall on my head while my knees were locked out, tore some ligaments in my knees there. Nothing to do with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now, does that mean that it's risk-free? Absolutely not. Our friend Robert pointed out in the comments that, yeah, the answer to this question is going to depend on what you are doing with these martial arts. Are you going to compete? 
Are you going to casually train? Are you going to spar? Are you simply going to go through the motions? For example, if you choose boxing, but you never actually box, meaning you never spar, you never fight, is that good exercise? Well, they're all good exercise if you don't take any damage. This goes without saying. But do any of these practices increase our lifespan? Because longevity means long life. Do any of these practices increase our quality of life? Well, of course. Because what does a quality of life mean? It means you've got something worth living for. I think when I was very young, I had this idea, very flawed idea, that I wanted to make it through life enduring as little pain as possible, taking as little damage, sustaining as few injuries as possible, and experiencing as little pain as possible. And that was the wrong mode of being. Because a life like that is purposeless. Pain is important, guys. Adversity is important. Struggle is important. It's not nice. We don't like it, but we need it. We need something to think about. We need something to mull over. We need something to look forward to. We need a challenge. I wrote out a list of things. I'm going to read some of these. I, I don't usually do this when answering somebody's question in these Q&A videos. But when our friend Derek wrote me his email, I wrote down some thoughts. I usually just speak from the heart, if you will. Let's see if I can find my thoughts. Are they in my notes here? There we go. I found them. I wrote down 10 keys for longevity. I'm just 45 years old. That's, that's, if I died today, most people would say, oh, he was too young. So, I can't really call myself a longevity expert. My grandmother was almost 100 years old when she died, and most people who attended her funeral said, well, it was her time. And every time I heard them say it was her time, it made me angry. I remember thinking, no, no. She... Ha she was one of the good ones. She was one of those people who really loved life and really lived life and really appreciated life, and not everybody is. She was old, yes. She lived on this planet approximately a century, but it felt like, no, it wasn't her time. But the time that she had, she used it, man. And these are some things I learned from my grandmother about longevity. Number one, have a purpose. Have a purpose. So even on the most une uneventful day, my grandmother had things that she would always do. She would go out in her flower garden and tend the flowers. She'd go out in her vegetable garden and tend the vegetables. She would chop wood for her wood-burning stove because she didn't use an electrical stove. She did all of her cooking on a wooden stove. I remember going to a museum recently and seeing... This, uh, this lady giving a tour about the way they used to live and back in the old days. And there was this, uh, this kitchen that looked very much like my grandmother's kitchen with one of those wood stoves, the exact same model. And the lady said something like, I bet you've never seen one of these. I was like, my grandma used that thing every day. So she had a purpose. There were, there were always chores she was doing. If it was cold and she couldn't go outside because... In Idaho, where we lived at the time, 
Winters were like 30 degrees below. It was so cold you'd grow icicles in your nose taking one breath. She made afghans. She'd crochet. My grandmother had one hand and um, one thumb, so her right hand was mostly gone when she was 15 years old in a table saw accident when she was working at a plywood factory. Lost her hand, except the thumb. And she was a right-handed person dealing with a left hand. And I never heard her complain about it. I never heard her sing a little pity song for herself, woe is me because I got my hand chopped off, boo hoo. No, never heard that. I just saw her do what she could do with what she had. And man, that woman could crochet fast. She had a purpose. Every day, whatever it was, she was doing something, whether it was for her own personal edification or for the edification of others. Number two, keep moving. Literally, literally, keep moving. Now, my grandmother never did martial arts. She was never into gym culture. I never saw her lift a dumbbell or a barbell. I saw her work. Every day I saw her work. Get up, walk around, move, work. And... I believe that is one of those things that kept her alive. And that's definitely one of those things that has kept me alive. When I was 21 years old, I got very, very sick, hospitalized, had a bunch of surgeries, got readmitted to the hospital again and again. For the better part of a year, I was hospitalized. And I just had to keep going back to get additional surgeries to try to fix this problem. And... The last doctor I spoke to gave me some very wise advice, which was, you've got to move more and move consistently. Because that movement is the medicine that you need. And that is when I started getting really into physical culture, which started with hobbling around with some kind of support because I couldn't stand on my own and relearning how to walk and then walking. And then walking every day, multiple times a day and then running, and then doing whatever it was that I could do. So moving literally, keep moving literally on a daily basis. Yeah, that's super important. And not just daily, like, I've moved 30 minutes today, so I don't need to move anymore. I'm just going to sit here on my butt the rest of the day. Look, if you're sitting down for an hour or so, two hours, get up and move around doesn't have to be a lot. Get the blood moving. That's important. Number three, keep moving forward figuratively. Just as we move forward literally by moving our body, engaging in physical culture, something else that is super important, move forward figuratively, meaning every day, every day, try to be a little bit better than yesterday. Do something every day to get stronger. Do something every day to get more flexible. Do something every day to get more technical. Do something every day to get smarter. Do something every day to get closer to God. Simple little things that push you forward rather than backward. It's easy to slide backward. It's easy to fall into a bad habit. And bad habits kill you young, friends. They kill you young. It's not just, oh... I shouldn't do this because I would be embarrassed if other people found out. No, bad habits kill you. Number four, be consistent. That sounds pretty self-explanatory, but be consistent. It's one thing to say, well, eat good food. Have a good sleep schedule. Exercise regularly. Okay, sure. It's a new year, friends. What do people do at New Year's? They sign up for a gym membership, and they go to the gym on that first day, and maybe the second day, maybe the third, and then they start getting this fatigue. And it's not so fun to push yourself toward these New Year's resolutions, is it? And so we kind of taper off. Ah, it'll be fine. I'll do it next week. I'll do it tomorrow. 
and then tomorrow comes and we put it off till tomorrow, etc. We say we're putting it off, really we're just not doing it. Being consistent means do it. So for example, you set your alarm. I'm going to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. The alarm goes off. What do you do? You wake up and you go about your day. Seems simple enough, right? But what do so many of us do? Snooze. Just five more minutes. Just 15 more minutes. Just, oh, no, I'm three hours late for work. Be consistent, friends. Number five, find joy. Joy. It's funny when, in the English language, when we use a word that is, what do we call it, based on Old French, we seem to ascribe more importance to it than the words that are based on Old German or Old English. For example, happy it's based on an Old English word. Joy is based on the Old French word for happy. And yet we, se we seem to think of joy as some sort of transcendent happiness. It's not just, oh, I ate a candy bar and I feel kind of okay type of happy. It's a transcendent happiness. So how do you find joy? As we were speaking of before, we need some type of opposition. You've got to overcome something to experience some joy. It's not simply the, the acquisition of stuff and things. The acquisition of stuff and things requires effort, for most of us anyway. We've got to work for it. And the work itself is the reward. Number six, focus on what you can do instead of what you can't. I hinted toward this before when I talked about my grandmother missing her hand and still spending the rest of her life working manually with a single hand because she focused on what she could do instead of what she couldn't. She had this little scrap of paper attached to her refrigerator with a magnet it was scrawled out with this little saying with very bad handwriting because in spite of the fact that my grandmother spent the better part of her long life without her right hand, she was right-handed and she never got good at writing at penmanship with her left hand. And so in this barely legible font, this scrap of paper that my grandmother wrote one of the first things she wrote with her left hand because she got her right hand chopped off. Live simply, give much, expect little. Number seven, be part of constructive communities. This is incredibly important for longevity. And this is something I was thinking about for the last maybe three years or so. So I made a video some time ago where I said something about vegans that made vegans very angry, and so they started leaving me all these links to vegan websites, vegan studies, and so on, saying vegans live longer than non-vegans. This study says so. And I looked at the study, and it was a study from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if you don't know, Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarians. They don't eat meat. They're not strict vegans, but they are vegetarians. They don't eat meat. And according to this study, Seventh-day Adventists lived longer than the other people in the study. It was a, a sample of like a hundred people or so from um, various walks of life in the United States. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting because there's, there are more variables in this study than just their diet. Because there are people out there who smoke and drink and do all kinds of awful stuff that's terrible for their health and they live a hundred years. So what, what else do we need to look at with the Seventh-day Adventist study? I thought, well, it's a religious group. So maybe there's a correlation with this religious community and their purported longevity. 
So I look into it, and I wonder, well, I wonder how many other studies have been performed on religion and longevity. And I looked into it, and there was a study by UCLA on this very topic, religious affiliation and longevity. And do you know which religious group had the longest lifespan, according to this study? The Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, excelled any other religious group, including the Seventh-day Adventists. And that's my church. That's the church I go to. That's the church I belong to. The, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints outlives the average American by nine years, which doesn't sound a lot, but if you would rather die right now or live another nine years, most of us would choose another nine years, I'm sure. For those of you asking Super Chats, I will, I will answer all the Super Chats after I finish answering this question. So, we will get to those I have not forgotten you. So, what was I saying? Ah, yes, so this study. And this isn't just a, yay, go Mormons, because we're, no. I started thinking critically about this. Okay, what is it about the LDS church in particular that causes the average member of this church to live nine years longer than the average American? Is it the diet? There's no special prescribed diet. We don't drink alcohol. We don't smoke. We don't drink coffee or tea or use harmful drugs. So, I mean, that helps. But there are lots of other people in that study who don't do those things, and they didn't have that same level of longevity. So what was it? I think it had a lot to do with the community. That's, that's what I'm getting at here. It's not just... They belong to the right group. It's the fact they belong to a group. A positive community is incredibly important. So when you ask about a martial arts group, a martial arts style that is best for longevity, the name of the style is pretty inconsequential. The positive effect of the group is going to be tremendous. There are toxic gyms out there, which are terrible and should be avoided and are just bad for your mental and physical health. And there are some great groups out there that are very supportive, that have people who will love and support and help you and push you to greatness and give you the right kind of adversity. And everybody should be lucky enough to belong to such a group. So there are lots of different types of positive communities. A church, we've mentioned that before. Those, there have been studies on that. There are a gym, a family. That's one of the big ones, man. Everybody wants to change the world. And most of us put the onus of responsibility to change the world on some government official. If we elect the right president or the right senator, it's going to change things. Well, I'll tell you what, that's... Not actually how it works. Change the direction the family goes and you're going to change the world. Because the world is made up of families. It is the smallest meaningful group of people that can affect change on the world in the most significant way. Why? Because that is where children are raised. And in that particular environment, that is how you shape the world. That is how you form the next generation. And the next generation changes the world for better or for worse. And that starts in the family. So be a part of a constructive community, a church, a gym, a club, your neighborhood, your community, your, your nation. But above all else, family. Number eight, spend time outside. I saw a video the other week about eyesight. And eyesight is something I struggle with. I'm a partially sighted 
person. My last fight left me with a serious injury, broken skull, and partially blind. Got some blind spots. And it's gotten worse over the years, in some ways. And this is not a woe is me, feel sorry for me type of speech, because it's an important type of adversity I'm actually grateful for in my life. But there was an eye doctor, this optometrist I'm listening to, and he, he pointed out some very interesting statistics about blindness in the modern world. People are going blind at an alarming rate, at a higher rate than any other point in history right now. And the culprit staying inside, looking at screens, doing kind of what we're doing right now, being on the internet, watching YouTube. Yeah, it's killing us, friends. It's costing us our eyesight. But there's a solution to this problem, this self-inflicted problem. And it's quite simple. Go outside. Spend about two hours outside every day. What, that forces us to, one, take our eyes off of a screen that is generally way too close to our face and look at things in the distance, look at things up close, change our focus from close to far. It's great for your eyesight. And yet most of us come up with all kinds of excuses of why we can't. Spend time outside. It's good for you. And once again, the overwhelming majority of people on this planet in the developed world are currently going blind because they're not. Facts. Uncomfortable facts. Number nine. Experience opposition in all things. We've hinted at this a lot throughout this discussion so far. Why is that important for longevity? Now, let's go back to those polls I put out where most people picked the easy answer. The thing that sounded like it's the lowest impact, like it's the simplest, lowest effort to do. And that's not always the right thing. Now... Let's go to the question, what's best for longevity, strength training or cardio? Most people picked cardio, and according to most of the studies that I've read, most people are wrong. That strength training has a much greater beneficial effect as far as promoting longevity. Now, once again, I'm not a scientist. I'm simply reporting what I've read. But I'll tell you what, when I was younger, I was way into cardio. I did a lot of distance running. I did all kinds of things, except for strength training. I did some push-ups once in a while, thought that was, that was strength training. I never really picked up a weight. And compared to how I feel now at age 45, now that I do lift weights and I focus on strength training regularly, I felt like garbage back then. In my 20s, I felt like garbage. I didn't think I did. But when you feel a contrast, a sharp contrast, I feel pretty good right now. I feel way better now. I don't want to go back to that. There's a massive difference. So, it's important to experience opposition in all things. The principle of progressive overload we learned from, from weightlifting, from strength training, from powerlifting, from all forms of resistance training is a principle that we can incorporate into so many other aspects of life, not just fitness training. But that opposition is what shows us our weakness and allows us to by understanding the weakness, become strong. And without that, we don't. We can't. Number 10. Connect to and love other living beings. 
So going back to my grandmother, because this is a list of 10 things I learned from my grandmother about longevity. Obviously, very loving woman, but let's talk about her cat. My grandmother had two cats. One of which she, she had for a very long time. It was this calico cat named Snoopy. She named it, named it that not after the uh, Charles Schultz cartoon character, but after, well, the word Snoopy, because it snooped around the place. Just some stray cat she took in. And the other was a black cat she caught in a trap. I don't know what she put that trap out for, but she caught a cat in it one day. And my grandmother, nicest lady ever, but bear in mind, she grew up in a very different era in the early 1900s. She was born in 1907, I believe. She named that cat the N-Word. My grandmother named this black cat the N-Word. And my grandmother loved that cat. So, she had these two cats. And she lived alone. Sure, her grandchildren would come to visit from time to time. Once in a while, one of her children would come to visit. But most of the time, she was by herself. Except for those cats. And something about having a relationship with another living being where you connect to it or specifically love it, and love is an action word, you show love for it meaning you render some sort of service. You feed a cat, for example. And cats aren't particularly loving creatures. It might seem like it. They rub up on you with their face. Do you know what they're really doing? They're marking you as their territory with scent glands on the sides of their faces. They're not loving you. Cats are cold-blooded killers, but they do a good service. They kill pests. So it's good to have a couple of cats around a farmhouse. Let me repeat this list. So in summation, for longevity, number one, have purpose. Two, keep moving literally. Three, keep moving forward figuratively. Four, be consistent. Five, find joy. Six, focus on what you can do instead of what you can't. Seven, be part of a constructive community. For example, a church, a gym, a family, a club, neighborhood, etc. Eight, spend time outside, preferably two hours a day. It's good for you. Nine, experience opposition in all things. And ten, connect to and love of other living beings. I would add one other thing to this list. Be grateful. Be thankful. Count your blessings. It's important, man, because if you go about in life feeling robbed and hard done by all the time, you're going to be filled with anger. You simply cannot be happy feeling ungrateful. It's not possible. And it's very difficult not to be in the right state of mind if you are filled with gratitude for whatever it is. One of the most important things that you can do is express gratitude. Don't just think it. Express it. If there is someone in your life you are grateful for, make them aware of that. If there is something in your life that you are grateful for, thank God for that. Do it often. Do it consistently. It's helpful, man. So, I imagine our friend, when he asked me this, was probably expecting some answer like, the best martial art for longevity is do, do some Tai Chi forms because it's nice and slow and it's not jarring. I'm not going to say that because that hasn't been my experience with the martial arts known as Tai Chi My very first time meeting a real master of Taiji who knew how to fight, I sparred with him, and he threw me on the ground, 
and he twisted my arms, and I walked away from that sparring session with some injuries. And I thought, man, if I train with that guy like that on a consistent basis, I'm going to get hurt badly. This man was 80 years old, by the way. So, let's talk about combat sports, though. Can you compete in combat sports at advanced stages? You can do anything you want at advanced stages. Let's, let's talk about brain damage for a minute. If an older man, if a senior citizen gets into a cage fight and he gets punched in the face and knocked out, oh, we don't feel good about that, do we? Makes us feel kind of gross, like, oh, man, no. He just hurt grandpa, no. If a guy who's 20 years old gets into a cage fight, gets punched in the face and knocked out the same thing, same consequence, we cheer for the guy who won, yeah, action, blood, violence, I'm into it, I'm here for it. And yet the guy in his 20s doesn't even have a fully developed brain. Did you know that? He's experiencing some massive, irreversible brain damage at a point in his life where he doesn't have a fully formed brain. The human brain doesn't completely develop until your mid-20s, around 24, 25, 26 years old. And yet, and yet, we push these young guys into combat sports, American football, rugby, all these other contact sports, which we think of as young man's games, that are doing probably the most damage possible to the human brain because it's done at a point in their lives where it's the worst possible time for traumatic brain injury. And yet we balk at the idea of a fully formed brain fighting because we realize there's something wrong with that. And what's wrong with that? At that point, we're supposed to be too smart to get into fights that we don't have to be getting into. Here's another question. Instead... Instead of being worried about what your quality of life will be like, your, what your quality of life will be like in a fictional future, a fictional imaginary future, ask yourself, what is my quality of life like today? Are you healthy today? Do you feel the way you want to today? If you felt this way for the rest of your life up until old age, would you be okay with that? Or, or is there something you're putting off here? Ask yourself, am I happy today? Is the level of happiness, joy, fulfillment you are experiencing in your life right now, if that was it, would you be content with that for the rest of your life if you couldn't go up from there? Probably not, because once we cut off progression, what is that? It's called damnation, friends. If you're stuck with the same old, same old, day in and day out, that's straight up damnation, man. Ask yourself this, are you doing, are you doing what is worthwhile today? Because it's really easy to tell yourself, tomorrow I'll do what's worthwhile, next year I'll do what's worthwhile, I'll make a New Year's resolution and at some point in the future this year, 2024, I will do what's worthwhile, but today I'll just sit on the couch and do whatever the... I'll take a day off. It's not the right answer. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. That 
same you that inhabits your body, that is your soul, that controls you, that makes decisions, that's in you today, that's going to be you tomorrow. And if you say, I won't today, that's the same guy tomorrow. You make a change today, guess what? The guy tomorrow is now different. We often tend to think of our future self as a different person. This is where procrastination comes from. We tell ourselves, that is tomorrow me's problem. I'm not going to wash the dishes today. I'll just leave them in the sink. Let them stink. Let the flies come and buzz about in my house. Because that's tomorrow me's problem. Tomorrow me, that other person that I don't care about, that I don't love, that's his problem. Tomorrow comes and suddenly you are met with a shocking revelation. You're the same guy. You've just dumped a problem onto yourself. Because yesterday you failed to love and appreciate yourself. Love is an action word. Love is services rendered, friends. So show some love for yourself, man, if you want some longevity. Have you shown love to anyone today? Have you lifted up the hands that hang down today? Because don't tell yourself that's tomorrow me's problem. I'll do that when I feel inspired. Because you won't. You must establish habits today that you want to live with into old age. So there is, there are my thoughts on longevity. Yeah, so let's talk about the martial arts aspect of that. So I've done a few podcasts with some older people who do martial arts. My friend Anthony, for example, he's in his 50s. He does praying mantis kung fu. He spars when he comes to my gym. He's, he's very fit. My friend Matt Grant a world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the IBJJF at every belt level from white to black. He's in his 60s. He started Jiu-Jitsu in his 50s. But when I did a podcast with Matt and I asked him about starting Jiu-Jitsu late in life, I started Jiu-Jitsu in my 20s. 44 now. I started in my 20s. Matt started in his 50s once again. And I was kind of expecting him to say, well, if I can do it, anybody can do it. He said the opposite. He said, look, jujitsu is hard on the body, as are all combat sports. And starting later in life when you're learning all, I'm paraphrasing here, I'm not quoting, Starting later in life when you, you're going to make a bunch of stupid mistakes, you're going to let people grab your head and squeeze and crank on your neck and do all of this stuff that when you're a more experienced jujitsu practitioner, you'll never let people do to you, but you don't know any better when you're a white belt and you're going to take some injuries and, and it's going to ravage your body a little bit. And he basically said, jujitsu is not for everybody. I want it to be for everybody. I want everybody to enjoy the things I enjoy about it, but I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. And I could say the same thing about all the other combat sports. Think about wrestling for a minute. We often think of cauliflower ear as like this, this badge of honor in wrestling and also mixed martial arts. And a lot of it is just luck of the draw, man. I've seen so many guys who wrestled throughout high school and college and 
never had a single bud or cauliflower ear on their ears, ever. And then other guys, like my friend Joe Mar, he wrestled in high school and college, and then he puts a gi on for the first time. He doesn't have any cauliflower ear. He puts on a gi. He rolls once. All of a sudden, his ears swell up. So why am I talking about cauliflower ear and wrestling? What usually happens, usually when people develop cauliflower ear is when they're young and they're starting wrestling and they make some mistakes and they get their faces ground into the dirt, ground into the mat specifically, because they're losing the wrestling exchange. And it's funny we think of it as a badge of honor because it's like, it, it, means, it means your ears got beat up a little bit. Or a lot. It means you're on the wrong side of a wrestling exchange. It's kind of like, kind of like a permanent black eye equivalent, if you will. So, I bring that up because there are that that's a physical, visible manifestation of wear and tear on the body from wrestling that you learn early on and later on in the wrestling career, you could have circumvented if you had the experience of an advanced wrestler that obviously beginners don't have. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Basically, if, if, if I could just, and this, as a coach, this is something I wish I could do, just upload my, all of my experiences into my students' brains and into their bodies so they could be like, aha, now I will avoid every single mistake you've ever made and be all the better for it and avoid a ton of injuries. That would be great. But unfortunately, there's a lot that still has to be learned by trial and error, regardless of how good your coach's intentions are. Boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai. They are difficult arts to get good at. They are... I want to say easy at the pick-up-and-play level of hitting a bag and feeling good about yourself and patting yourself on the back and feeling like you've accomplished something without ever fighting. But it's impossible to do that with grappling arts because with a grappling art, you have to have another person. You have to essentially compete with another person to some extent, even if it's just a friendly, low-energy flow grappling exchange. But if you never compete in a striking art, and a lot of people are in that boat, it's easy to feel like you're doing something when you're, doing, when you're not actually doing the thing. Because you are doing the exercises, the preparatory exercises that the people who do the thing do. So if you're saying boxing is good for longevity, or boxing is good for avoiding damage, what you really mean is doing boxing-related exercises is good for your health, as long as you don't actually box. Well, that's about all I want to say about longevity in combat sports. Tomorrow is not a guarantee, friends. We all tell ourselves this story of, I want to be in this kind of shape when I'm 70 years old or 80 years old or 90 years old. I I don't know if I'll live that long. I don't. I mean, I had so many brushes with death decades ago, and every day since is just an absolute blessing. I wake up every day, hallelujah, I'm alive. Thank the Lord, literally. Thank the Lord for it. So I'm going to back up and answer the super chats that you folks sent in, and I'm going to open up the conversation to general questions after that. We have a super chat from our friend Dragon. Thank you for the donation, my friend. Says, Ramsey, Happy New Year's. Happy New Year to you, too. Question, how much did martial arts help you during 20, 
23. Oh, boy. How much did martial arts help me? Well, there are a lot of ways I could answer this question. If you want a story about, well, I was walking down the street and some ninjas jumped out, pulled out their bow staffs, and then I whipped out my sai and my nunchucks and I beat them up, that didn't happen. So if that's the kind of story you wanted, I'm sorry. I'm a martial arts instructor. I'm a coach. Martial arts is something I'm involved with every single day. If I'm not doing it, I'm thinking about it. If I'm not thinking about it, I'm sleeping. So how much did it help me? I mean, it's, it's how I earn my living. It's how I feed my family. It's, it's, it's how, how I pay the bills. It's, it's how I put money in a savings account, man. It's so you could say that's very helpful. Martial arts to me is a microcosm of everything else. I wish I had the time to spend an infinity of lifetimes walking this planet, learning everything there is to learn, but I can't. None of us can. And even if we could spend 10,000 lifetimes, we'd just know a little fraction of what there is, and hopefully by that time we would be wise enough to realize that we know nothing. But I have found that intense and deliberate study of one thing can yield wisdom about many things that are tangential to it. So delving into martial arts at every level I think is very helpful to develop as a person, as a human being, physically, intellectually, spiritually, etc. There are many ways to approach this. Probably the most important way that martial arts has helped me is connecting with other human beings. I had a really interesting conversation with... Um, with some folks who came to my gym, they were YouTube fans, they were visiting Shanghai, and they, they wanted to do a private lesson with me. It was awesome. We did some jujitsu, and afterward, they treated me to lunch. We, we sat down and we talked, and I found out that they were really, really into some ideas about internal martial arts which are very inconsistent with what I believe. And I thought, oh, how interesting. A radically different point of view. And we had some discussions about no-touch type of martial arts, like people who, who believe that they can, I don't know, emit some power through their hands or through their body in some way to manipulate another person with, without making physical contact or minimal physical contact or doing things that seem impossible and and so on and i'm listening to them and they said you probably think we're crazy and i said well it sounds like you believe what you're saying it sounds like this has been your experience and that's why you believe it it wouldn't make sense to believe that thing if it wasn't your experience now we can explain experience away a lot of ways like maybe Maybe you didn't see or experience what you thought you experienced. Maybe it was something else. Maybe you experienced exactly what you thought you experienced. Maybe there are things out there that I don't understand. Maybe there are 15,000 other ways to explain this. But if we really want to seek wisdom... If you want to get smart, friends, instead of trying to explain away things, try to understand things. And I'm not saying try to understand no-touch knockouts. Try to understand the people who believe in this stuff. Why do they believe it? I think that's more beneficial. 
developing the right vocabulary to have an uplifting discussion is that's something that helps, man. Because imagine this. If I sat down with these guys and they said, essentially, you know, we, we believe in these internal martial arts and I've seen some guys who can do some crazy looking things that you'd probably make fun of. And I said, <laughs> I'm going to make fun of you because what you believe is silly. What you say you have experienced is illogical. What would have happened? They would have shut off immediately. And that conversation would be dead. We might still talk to each other, but we wouldn't connect at any sort of meaningful level like a, a pair of human beings. I was watching a TV show with my wife. And there's a scene. What's that show called? I don't remember. Anyway, there's a scene. There is a protagonist and she wants, she wants to, I don't remember what she wants, but she wants something. And there is an antagonist, not like an evil supervillain or anything, but just someone who has a divergent set of goals. And person B doesn't want to do what person A wants. And the first person, the protagonist is like, instead of, hey, let's talk about this picks up a stick and whacks the other person over the head. The second person doesn't die and gets up and is very mad and essentially says, well, that's it. We're not having this conversation anymore. You're clearly not my friend, not someone I can trust. You just hit me with a stick. Bye-bye. You will never get what you want now. Conversation over. So it's really easy to burn bridges. It's much harder to build them. We have another super chat from the Jughead One, who says, Happy New Year, Ramsey. Thank you. Keep up the great work. We appreciate it. More live broadcasts, please. Love and respect from the UK brother. Awesome. No questions there, but a nice message from the Jughead One. Thank you very much. And let me scroll down and see if anybody else has left any super chats here. Yes, they did. Bogus Blade Gaming sent in a super chat. If I follow a boxing routine, can I stimulate a wombat nexus with aforementioned command benefit to each command sequence? Can I sub-saturate my rump? This is an oddly specific question. I don't know if this is a serious question using jargon I am not familiar with, or if it is a joke question and you just wanted to hear me read that out loud with my voice. Let me read it out loud one more time in case that is the situation so you can really get your money's worth. If I follow a boxing routine, can I stimulate a wombat nexus with aforementioned, aforementioned command benefit to each command sequence? Can I sub-saturate my rump? Stimulate a wombat? What is a wombat? Okay, I'm going to Google this just in case this is a real thing. I think this is a joke comment. But I'm going to look it up. Maybe it's like a, a movie reference. M Wombat Nexus. I'm getting no Google results for Wombat Nexus. So either to this question, I'm just going to have to say, I don't know, man. I don't know. But I'm not going to judge you. Get out there and subsaturate your rump, my friend. I'll just assume that's code for get out there and train. We, uh, we have another super chat from BJJ5K who says, I had heat stroke last summer during jujitsu. I almost died. Yeah, man, that's something that can happen. Stay hydrated, stay cool, friends. I still experience fear when I'm on the mat. Do you have any advice to overcome this fear? Okay. There are different types of fears, rational fears, irrational fears. This, this is a fear based on a rational fear. You had heat stroke. You almost died. You, you were in a serious situation, right? The last time I got knocked out during sparring, it was supposed to be a light, friendly sparring match, and dude threw a head kick. 
right there, right behind the, the head, right on the neck, with just the right amount of power, and boop, down I went. And man, I felt weird coming too, and I remember thinking like, I'm in my 40s, I know what people are going to be saying. They're going to be telling me, stop sparring. It's not good. For you. It was never good for you, man. It was never good for you. As far as concussion and brain damage are concerned, as far as the lessons learned on the mat, different situation. So I went into each sparring session after that with a certain type of fear, not fear like, I'm going to die. Fear is not the right word. I guess you should say a healthy respect for potential danger that was heightened from what it previously was. So the fear of heat stroke during the hot summer, obviously it's a rational fear, but we, that, any rational fear can turn into an irrational fear. And I see this all the time in the self-defense industry specifically. And I'm making a distinction between martial arts industry and self-defense industry. That's the fear-mongering industry, friends. So they start out with a rational fear. Maybe somebody is attacked or assaulted. And they think, well, I need to learn to defend myself in case this happens again. And so they go to the self-defense class and they're there for presumably the right reasons. But that legitimate fear, somebody attacked me and I wish I knew how to fight back more effectively in that situation turns into paranoia about this is going to happen every day, every hour, every time I go outside and ah, you've been fear mongered friends. I've had this experience a, a number of times. Basically, any time I sustained a serious injury, I there, there's this natural proclivity to try to avoid that thing that hurt you. You touch a flame, ow, it hurts, I'm burned, I won't do that again. Now, the lesson there is don't touch the flame. Don't get hurt. If... You learn some simple lessons. Don't train in extremely hot rooms without adequate ventilation. Maybe take some breaks, drink plenty of water, rehydrate frequently. Martial artists often tend to be too tough for their own good. Combat sports people in particular. In a jujitsu class, there's this, this need to prove yourself. I can't show weakness. The coach is watching. I want to be up for a promotion. I want to get a stripe on my belt. If he sees me slacking and taking a rest round and sipping water on the sidelines, he'll think I'm weak and then I won't get my blue belt or my purple belt or my black belt or whatever the thing is. We tell ourselves all these stories about things that won't happen. Leading up to a fight, for example, a professional fight. We've got weeks, months in advance sometimes where we create an imaginary monster that we're going to face that we won't actually face in the cage, but we face him in our minds. He's going to kill me. He's going to tear me apart. He's got claws. He's got teeth. He's a gorilla. He's a tiger. He's... Oh. And then it's just some dude at the end of the day. And that is not constructive fear. Irrational fears... Let's do without them. Rational fears, learn from them. So my advice for you, BJJ 5K, learn from the rational fear and do rational things in response. Stay cool, take adequate rest rounds, drink plenty of water. And if you're sweating a lot, get some electrolytes in you, man. All right, I'll 
answer a few more questions here before I have to go. Anthony Nguyen says, what would be the first three techniques you would teach a complete combat sports beginner in the context of MMA? Hmm. I have taught many, many, many complete beginners over the years. And I don't always teach them the same thing. I've tried a bunch of different methods, and now I'm generally working under the assumption they're going to come back for another lesson and another and another and another. So putting all your stock into, if you learn these three techniques, you're good. No, you're not good unless you do it consistently. But the first few things, I and people assume the first few things you learn are probably going to be the most important. So is this a question? My mind is reading this as what are the most, the three most important techniques to learn in the context of MMA. But the first three techniques you learn are generally not the ones you're going to win fights with. They're going to be stuff that is going to allow you to survive. And you worry about winning later. But generally I find teaching position first, which is generally not that exciting and not that sexy, but it's super important and will ensure your survival. If you don't know anything about martial arts, you don't know how to wrestle, you don't know how to grapple, you don't know how to box, you don't know any of that, you don't know what footwork is, you don't know what a guard is, three techniques is not enough. you're going to get taken down very quickly in the context of MMA in that situation. So you're going to have to learn what a guard is and how to get up. And that by itself is a lot more than just three techniques. It's two concepts and there are many techniques involved in that process. We, we tend to put a lot of stock in individual techniques, but think more about concepts and game plans. What happens in an MMA fight if you don't know how to fight and you're fighting someone who does? Generally, they will take you down immediately. Why? Because it's really, really easy to control somebody who doesn't know how to grapple once you take them down. Even a complete noob who is wildly flailing can still scratch you and claw you and inflict damage on you, even if it's fairly inconsequential damage. Who wants to get poked in the eye or scratched or, any, or bitten or any of that nonsense that, that noobs always do instinctively? Or kicked in the groin? When you could just take them down, pin them, and then do whatever you wanted, however you wanted, whenever you want, and take zero damage. So you're going to have to deal with that. Should I learn takedown defense? Takedown defense is learning takedowns. It's learning the entire sport of wrestling. You won't understand takedown defense until you understand takedowns. You've got to be a competent grappler to do that. Now... Jiu-jitsu is the defensive aspect of grappling. That does not mean there are no offensive attacks in jiu-jitsu. It means it's the defensive aspect of grappling, meaning, let's say somebody takes you down. What's the guard? In boxing, it's your hands, your arms, your shoulders, your elbows, protecting your face and your body, your chin and your neck. What's the guard if you're on your back on the ground? Somebody took you to... It's your legs, it's your knees, it's your hips, it's your feet. 
to keep the danger as far away from your vitals as possible. That's what a guard is. It's using your limbs to protect your vitals. A guard can be both offensive and defensive. Primarily defensive to block, to parry, to redirect, or on the ground to push, to pull, to sweep, to get up, and of course to attack. So learning what a guard is for and how to use that to get back up on your feet, it's important. The next thing you should probably learn the next concept, not technique, but concept you should probably learn. How to punch. We got a super chat from BJJ5K. That was a beautiful answer. Thank you, my friend. Hey, thank you. You didn't have to do that, but you did. Appreciate it. Make for you, says, Hi, Ramsey, is weed bad for your condition. Smoking marijuana is bad for you, period. It's, it's not good for you. It doesn't do you a single ounce of good. You can argue about that all day. And at this point in my life, I've got zero empathy for marijuana apologists, man. It is... A gateway drug. I know people said that a lot back in the 90s and the early 2000s. It's a gateway drug and people laughed at it. It's legal now in a lot of states in the U.S. My 15-year-old niece died a few weeks ago of a drug overdose, fentanyl. She didn't start with that. It started with weed. doesn't do you one lick of good. Now that is a, that's one situation. That's just one person. Well, guess what? Every person counts. Every person matters. It's never good, friends. It's never good. Vito Roma says BJJ is too rough on shoulders and knees. Some muscles gain, some muscle gain definitely helps to protect the joints. Well, yeah, look, all combat sports are rough on your joints. All of them. All of them. You know what else is rough on your joints? Running, jogging, especially jogging. Moving in general, life in general is rough on your joints. You know what else is rough on your joints? Sitting in a chair. You notice I'm moving around here? Because sitting for a prolonged period of time is uncomfortable. Why? Because it's bad for your joints. You know what else is bad for your joints? Picking up a cell phone and looking at it like this. That's murder on your neck. That will do more damage than your neck than somebody neck cranking you in a jujitsu class. And you're probably doing that a whole lot more often. How do you best deal with this situation. Well, Vitor, you hinted at it. Some muscle gain definitely helps to protect the joints. You are correct. Prehab, friends. You want to avoid injuries, get strong. We already know people are going to be attacking your joints, your neck, spine, cervical spine, etc. will will be sustaining pressure so we got to make those strong. In karate, karateka use a makiwara. They hit it, this wooden pole wrapped in ropes, and they punch it a bunch of times to toughen up their fists because they know that if they don't toughen up their fists and then they punch something hard, that they will sustain injuries to their hands. And so they do this conditioning exercise to make the fist strong enough to sustain the activity, to do the activity. Do the same thing with jujitsu. Make the stress 
points on your body tough enough to do the activity. That is true with every single sport. Look, almost every single sport takes their sport seriously, except martial arts. Except martial arts. Here's what I mean by that. And I made a few videos on this channel, things called martial artists are terrible athletes, jujitsu practitioners are ter terrible athletes. I've talked about this a lot on my channel. And this annoys people because they know some martial artists who are tremendous athletes. But look, most martial artists don't take their training as seriously as, say, a baseball player or a bobsledder. Or someone who does curling in the Winter Olympics. Not this type of curling, the type where you sweep the... Those dudes are in the weight room. And you can't say that about every martial artist, not even the majority of them. Somebody asked, I'm... who is it? AMS, Ramsey, is it possible to condition your throat? Condition means change in this context. I assume you mean the, the muscles at the front of your neck. Yeah, you can condition the muscles at the front of your neck and your jaw at the same time. Check this out. Flex the mouth and the neck like this. So I'm pulling my jaw down, pushing it forward, and then pulling it up slowly while flexing every muscle. Yeah, I know it's a goofy looking thing, but yeah, that'll give you a stronger neck in the front, a stronger jaw. And guess what? If you're one of those folks that deals with the double chin, I actually learned this exercise from my aunt. She used to have like a double, triple chin thing going on. And I remember thinking like, man, she's younger than my mom and she's... She's got like a giant double chin going on. She saw a physical therapist who prescribed this exercise for her. She did a few of those every day for about a year, and then boom, no more double chin. Very ap appropriate content says, double chin is a hormonal thing. I doubt that will work. Well, it worked. Anecdotal, sure. Uh, SBV says, Coach, what is a good variation of deadlifts for injured fingers? Well, there are a lot of ways to modify a deadlift if you have injured fingers. If you're not able to grip a bar, you can use straps if that's still not enough. Use hooks. Do you know what a deadlifting hook is? I've got some in my gym bag over there, but I'm going to have to climb over a bunch of stuff to get them. Look it up. Deadlifting hooks, like if you can't grip with your fingers because they're too injured, just get some hooks, man. They wrap around your wrists, and then there's essentially a metal hook that you hold on to like this, and then you just wrap your hands over the bar, pull it up. Minimal stress on the fingers, so it's not going to work your grip, but you still will be able to do some deadlifts that way. Give it a try. Got a super chat from Maddie Wadsworth. No question attached, just a donation. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Roran Hammer says... 
Coach, should Tony Ferguson retire after seven consecutive losses? Well, what's he going to do after he retires? That's my question. A lot of you might be thinking, well, he's lost a bunch of fights, so he should retire because, because I don't see him winning fights next. But look, think of this from Tony Ferguson's perspective. That's his job. That's his job. What, what's he going to do next? This is the question the professional fighters, unfortunately, tend to address ex post facto a little too late into their careers. Imagine for a minute, how many of you are professional fighters? Maybe, maybe a couple of you are, I don't know. But I imagine most of you have normal jobs. Maybe you're a bank teller, maybe... Maybe you're an accountant. Maybe, I don't know what you do. Maybe you're a school teacher. Imagine you go into work. Maybe you flip burgers for a living. I don't know. You go into work, and then your boss says, you know what? Your coworker performed slightly better at his duties in this job than you did seven consecutive times in a row. Therefore, we are letting you go. You're fired. Doesn't seem very fair, does it? And yet that's kind of what we tend to expect from professional fighters. Because in a fight, someone wins and someone loses. There's, there's no second place in a cage fight. So Tony's lost seven fights in a row and the fans are throwing their hands up saying he, he needs to hang up the gloves. AMS says Tony is an employee at the end of the day. So if he's not performing, he will get fired. Well, look, what does his contract say? His contract says he is paid to show for the event. He is not paid to win. His contract is not contingent upon winning. It is contingent upon showing. What does that mean? That means you make weight, you step in the cage, and when the referee says, are you ready? You say yes. And when he says fight, you fight. That is a combat sports athlete's contract. And if he fulfills that job, win, lose, whether it's glorious or lackluster, he's done his job. He's fulfilled the contract. So I'm asking you to step outside your, your role as a fan, as an observer, and put yourself in the shoes of Tony Ferguson. What's he supposed to do if he retires right now because he's lost, lost a few consecutive fights? What would you do? Now, most of you have other jobs, other skill sets, other ways of making money. Do you know why cage fighters are cage fighters most of the time? Do you know why prize fighters in general are prize fighters most of the time? Because they don't have other options. Videos for stuff probably mostly unlisted says, Hey, Ramsey, if you ref an MMA match and one of the fighters, dead ancestors slash mentors, comes into the octagon as a ghost and starts shadowing the fighter's movements, would that be a stoppage? As far as I'm aware, there's no... Huh. Is a ghost a person? I would say so, yes. And... Other people besides the fighters and the referee are not allowed to enter the ring or the octagon. So if a ghost comes in and physically, visibly manifests itself 
and he starts doing something in that cage, yeah, we're stopping the match, and we're going to ask that ghost to leave. Maybe we'll perform an exorcism or something. But uh, that would be a violation of the rules. So ghosts get out of the octagon. Mystery Man says, I don't see fighters being punched on the nose, neither in professional or amateur fights. Is there an unwritten rule or code of honor among fighters about not hitting the nose? I think you need to watch more fights because that happens all the time. All the time. Now, amateurs tend to be terrible at hitting their targets and actually finding the nose. Professionals tend to be pretty good at avoiding strikes. And so maybe that's what you're seeing. You're seeing people miss. The punches to the nose, man, it happens. I don't know if you notice this, but my nose is not in its original position. Why? Because I've been punched in the nose quite a few times. Somebody person says, Mr. Dewey, can you explain the uses of the full Nelson? Yeah, to bully people. The full Nelson is what you do when the other person doesn't know what the heck they're doing and you're able to get the half Nelson and instead of, you know, wrestling, they just kind of sit there and do nothing and so you're like, well, let me get another one. Let me bully this person and do whatever the heck I feel like. That's the, that's the function of a full Nelson. It's just bullying a dude who doesn't know what he's doing. Roar and Hammer says, why didn't you bob and weave, coach? You can't bob and weave when you're pinned to the mat, friends. Let's answer maybe one more question. Maybe two if you have a good one. I liked that ghost question. It was entertaining. Taking a while to find a question here. Ray Cianello says, Coach, do you have tips for cultivating aggression in BJJ for a mild-mannered person? Yeah, get squashed and beaten up a little bit. And then realize that uh, getting squashed and beaten up in BJJ isn't really that bad. And it's not the end of the world, and you're not broken, and you're not actually beaten up. You just had somebody pin you, and then you did this, and you realize, oh, that's all it is. And then go do that to other people. It's fun. Now, to be aggressive, cultivating aggression in BJJ, you've got to learn how to wrestle first. You've got to add the offensive aspect of grappling as well. Because if all you know how to do, say, for example, is guard work and play guard, eh, you can aggressively hunt for submissions in the guard, but it's, it's not really a position that lends itself to an aggressive mentality. You're not chasing the other person, you're, you're making them come to you. So, just understand, the consequences 
of doing this in jujitsu are not that bad. Your training partners are going to be okay if you armbar them as long as you are being a good training partner and not oh, thrusting your hips into the armbar and snapping their elbows. Give them time to tap out. They'll be fine. It's okay. And if you're still not okay with that, you know what? Do a boxing sparring session at least once in your life and realize it can be a lot worse. A couple of super chats here. Okay. Maddie Wadsworth says, I recently got back into BJJ. Thanks partially to your channel. Cool. Everybody else in my class is stronger than me. Do you have any advice? Okay. Learn how to exploit the north-south position. When you get to side control, what's probably happened, if you've got, if you've got much larger, stronger opponents on the bottom, and this, this, this is a question I, I field a lot with, with female students of mine who, who actually have pretty good technique, sometimes better technique than their training partners, who often are men who are much larger and stronger than them. And they're like, I, I can't control these guys in side control. A lot of times I can't even get to side control. They're just too strong and they just push me off and do all these other things. Look, north-south position is a smaller, weaker person's friend. Because if you really understand that position, you don't have to control as much of your opponent. It's all of your weight against the neck and one shoulder. Whereas if you're in side control, you're pretty much trying to control the entire torso and the hips. So learn to exploit north-south. Now I can tell you some other things, like get as strong as you can, but there, there's a limit to how strong you're going to get. You're probably smaller than the other people in class. A person with a larger frame has more potential to get stronger doing the same work as you. And so that's kind of a dismissive answer. Y yeah, you should be hitting the weight room, of course. Do some deadlifts, do some squats, do some pull-ups. That will help to an extent. And you should. But as far as a technical answer that will give you immediate rewards, when you get to side control, move to north-south and master that position and learn to attack f and control and wear your opponents out from that position. We have another super chat from Ritnox, who says, any advice from my buddy that's planning on training full-time after he's been fired from his job? He's never had the opportunity to train this seriously, but he wants to give it a go to compete. He's going to train full-time? Cool. Enjoy it. That's a pretty general question. Okay, your friend's going to... Asking for a friend, of course. He's been fired from his job, so he's going to train full-time. Does he want to be a professional fighter? Or is he just training full-time until he gets a, another job for recreational purposes? I, I don't know. I'm going to assume he wants to be a professional fighter. He's fired from his job, and so his new job is fighting pro, right? But he's never done it before. At least not to this level. When you're a noob, everybody's better than you, everybody's stronger than you, and it is really upsetting to a lot of people. And a lot of people will quit specifically because of that. It's, it's something that happens with all pursuits of talent, but it feels different in combat sports because you are losing a physical contest with physical consequences that can leave you bruised up and tired and injured sometimes. If I hand you a cello and you don't play the cello and I say play Chopin for me, play his masterworks, and you say, oh, well, I can't do that. I don't know how to, how to play the cello. You don't feel bad about it because, well, you haven't put in the work. You understand how that works. You go to a jiu-jitsu class for the first time. You get squashed and submitted 50 times every single roll, and you feel terrible about yourself, even though, logically, well, I've never trained jiu-jitsu before, and so I shouldn't feel bad about not being good at jiu-jitsu yet. But we do 
because we're losing a fight a bunch of times in a row and we feel like I should be able to get better at this or I've been doing jiu-jitsu for three months straight and I'm still not able to beat the white belts. Everybody's better than me. It's rough. It's rough. Mentally. Probably more than physically. But you have to understand this, and this is a conversation I had with, with uh, a student recently who's been training for a few weeks. This, uh, this young woman who had a similar question about, you know, everybody's stronger than her, but also everybody's better than her. I said, look, you won't be the new guy forever. And after training for about a month, a new student came in and uh, Kat, that's her name, shout out to Kat. Kat gets on the mat with the new student and they roll and Kat taps out her training partner and her face kind of lights up like, I did it. I'm not the new guy anymore. I can actually beat someone. My technique works. Ah. Oh. And she's surprised. And we have a little conversation about it. And it, it seems like common sense, like you do it long enough and eventually you're going to get better. But you don't know until you know, man. So my advice, log some serious hours. Before you start asking for very specific training tips, from me, log a hundred hours of mat time. And, and I'm not talking about just showing up to the gym and, and repping out techniques and doing sequences and doing drills. I mean, a hundred hours of sparring. Do a hundred hours of sparring. Jiu-jitsu, boxing, wh whatever your thing is. And that is going to transform you. That is going to allow you to experience the limitations necessary to start asking the right questions and making this question go from very general to very specific. You need some very specific questions to get the right answers. We have a super chat from the Jughead One who says, Greetings again, Ramsey. Great broadcast. No questions, just showing my appreciation, love, and respect from the UK, brother. Hey, thank you. The Jughead One, much appreciated. Robert Sothman makes a very salient point here. He says, another point is that you can't expect to get better at fighting in any style if the only time that you think about this sport is during class. Amen. Yeah, man. If you're not reflecting on what happened on the mats as you're about to fall asleep as n at night thinking, man, how... Do I solve this problem I couldn't solve at the gym? And you roll it, you mold it over, yeah, yeah. The, the wheels start turning in your mind. If that's not happening, you're doing it wrong, man. If the only time you're thinking about your sport is at the gym during class, yeah. It's not enough. How many times do you guys train? Some of you train... Once a week, twice a week, three times a week, six days a week, seven days a week, two a days, three a days, every day, right? But that's still a finite amount of time. And if you want to improve, right, you got to do some extracurricular thinking, not just, not necessarily training outside of the gym, although in, in a lot of cases I would recommend it. If you tr only train three or four times a week, which if you're working a full-time job, that might seem like a lot. Might seem like a lot of training. It's still a fairly limited amount of training. Three, four times a week. You'll develop some skills, but what if you could develop those skills twice as fast? If you're taking a boxing class, for example, and you train boxing three or four times a week, but you never shadow box outside of class on your own time at home, well, guess what? You are limiting your potential greatly. What if I told you, if you just take the personal initiative to do three rounds of shadow boxing on your own without anybody telling you to, except me, of course, 
because I just told you to. On your own, on your own time, using your own initiative, in your own space, not at the gym, that you would improve twice as fast. I'm just going to throw that number out there. Why? Because that's the kind of thing, those are the kind of results I have observed from students who take the initiative to do three rounds of shadow boxing. And that's it. And literally nothing else besides that outside of class. Why? Because it, one, forces you to think about boxing outside of the gym. Two, it forces you to be creative outside of the... Three, besides the creativity aspect, it means you have the personal initiative to do what it takes to achieve greatness. If you do not have the personal initiative to take any steps forward outside of the gym when a coach is watching you like a hawk and you're trying to impress him to get a stripe on your belt or a gold star on your diploma, whatever the heck it is, when nobody's watching and nobody's going to reward you for it, if you don't have that, you don't have what it takes to achieve any level of greatness. When I say get out there and train, do you remember that pandemic where people were locked in? Yeah, that sucked, didn't it? And I made videos and I ended every video with get out there and train and I got hundreds and hundreds of comments from people saying, I can't get out there and train, I'm locked in. Now, I can appreciate the sentiment. I was locked in my home without adequate water and no food except for food storage that, that I had at home for months. And it's very difficult to do serious athletic training when you don't have enough water to drink. But guess what? I still found a way to get out there and train. And by that I mean using the personal, personal initiative to train at home, to do what I could. That required modification. I couldn't do the same workouts that I was used to. But I still found ways to move forward. Instead of focusing on what I could not, I focused on what I could. Now, I took a hit, a big one. Physically, oh, man, I lost a lot of strength. My physique got worse, yeah. And then I got COVID, and it got really bad. Man, I could barely walk after that. And then uh, as I was recovering from COVID, I went to Australia, did that ultimate self-defense championship. And then that dude fell on my head over there in Australia and snapped the ligaments in my left knee. And that was a major setback. And it still is to this day. And there have been so many things in 2023 I have not been able to do. I have not been able to train the way that I am used to, the way that I want to. At that high level, man... And it sucks, but I have to tell myself, focus on what you can do, not what you can't, because there's too much that I can't do right now. And if I focus on that, it's depressing and demoralizing, and I'm just going to be sad and angry and furious all the time, and I cannot live like that. I keep saying one more question and then two more pop up that I <laughs> start answering. Yeah. All right, guys. I'm going to call it a night. Happy New Year, everybody. May all your wildest dreams come true this year. Why? Because you're going to make them come true. It's not just a, let's make a wish and never speak of it again. Do you ever do that thing where you like, do you have like 
wish-making traditions in your culture, like break a wishbone and the person who gets the bigger piece or the smaller piece or whatever it is gets the wish, but you can't tell anybody or your wish won't come true or you blow out the birthday candle and make wish, but you can't tell anybody or that wish won't come true. You see a falling star, you make a wish, but you can't tell anybody or your wish won't come true. Well, guess what? You want to make your wishes come true, make them come true yourself. You got to get out there and do the work if you want to see the result. That's a true principle. Thanks for watching. Now get out there and train.